Welcome back to the domain of Buddhist audio bookshelf. Today, we resume our exploration of Dharma talks by Thanissaro Bhikkhu, Jeffrey Degraff. Let's delve deeper into these thought-provoking teachings together. Crafted meticulously by our team at Buddhist Audio Bookshelf, this audiobook shares the wisdom of Buddha. Your support in spreading these teachings is invaluable. Subscribe, like, and share to extend the reach of these transformative insights. Let's nurture a world enriched by the profound guidance of Buddha. Relax and absorb these teachings' essence as we journey on this enlightening path. Let's start with today reading. Interconnectedness. September 7, 2003. Everything in life is very interconnected. Everything is dependent on conditions, and the things we do then in turn become conditions for other things in life not only in our own lives, but also in the lives of the people around us. It's like throwing a pebble into a pond. The waves go out in many directions and can sometimes cover the whole pond. They can even bounce off the shore and come back in many intricate patterns. This principle of interconnectedness can be a good or a bad thing depending on what you do with it. Some people think that interconnectedness is automatically a good thing, but when you remember that harmful actions are also part of the general web and they can have repercussions that go on for a long time, that's a scary thought. Also, our happiness often depends on the actions of other people, many of whom we don't even know. So how can we trust them? We like to think we can trust the conditions on which our life depends, but when you really think about it, you realize how fragile the whole enterprise is if you're looking for happiness outside. This is why the practice has us turn inward, because their inside is the element of our experience that's not dependent on outside conditions. That element consists of the choices we're making from moment to moment. Those can be free. They don't have to depend on outside conditions. Otherwise we'd be in a totally deterministic universe. There'd be nothing we could do. We'd be cogs in a machine, whirling around as the other cogs whirl around. But that's not the way things are. We do have choices. And it's through our choices that we turn. The principle of interconnectedness into either a good or a bad thing, depending on how skillful or unskillful our choices are. As we're meditating we're trying to train this potential for freedom. We're trying to actualize it in a good way by working on the skillfulness of our intentions, because those are the forces over which we have some control. The things we intend to do, the choices we make. If we can do them with more mindfulness, more alertness, we find that gradually we do become more and more skillful. So, as you're sitting here with your breath, try to be as mindful as possible of what you're doing. Try to keep your mindfulness as continuous as possible. That strengthens your mindfulness. As for your alertness, try to be as sensitive as possible to the breath. How does it really feel to breathe? Where do you notice the sensation that lets you know, now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out? Where do you feel those sensations? How do they feel? Do they feel good? Do they feel okay but not especially good? Do they actually feel uncomfortable? If they feel uncomfortable, try different ways of breathing. Adjust the breath. You do have this freedom right here, this element of choice with regard to the breath. The breath is one of the few bodily processes that can be automatic, but also can be shaped by your choices. So work with it, explore it. Try to become more sensitive to this aspect of your awareness. As you become more sensitive to the breath, you also become more sensitive to the mind. That's important, because if we want to be able to judge the quality of our intentions, we have to be really clear about what they are, to make sure there's nothing hiding behind them. In other words, our intentions can often present a really nice face to us, but if you dig down a little deeper you find there's something else behind the face. Something that's not quite so pretty, something that you'd prefer to hide from yourself. And yet, part of you knows what's going on. So, one of the immediate benefits of the practice is that once we become more honest with ourselves, there's less of this internal deception. The mind plays fewer games with itself, and as a result it can be clearer about what it's doing. Right now, clearer about what input it's putting into the interconnected system in which we live. 
This is important because the basic principle is that the more good you put in, the more good you experience, and it also helps the people around you. In the West we often think that you have to work either for your own good or for the good of the people around you, but you can't do both together, whereas the Buddhist principle is that if you're really skillful, you get to do both at the same time. The good things you do help you and help the people around you if you're really skillful. This means going beyond ordinary good intentions to informed good intentions, skillful good intentions. Those are the kinds of intentions you want to work on. As we meditate we're developing the qualities we need to make our intentions more skillful. We take our one intention which is to stay with the breath right now, not to let ourselves get knocked off by other thoughts and we try to maintain that intention. In maintaining the intention we learn an awful lot about what it means to give rise to an intention, maintain the intention, check. The intention, make it more and more skillful with practice. We intentionally shape this process because the most important type of interconnectedness is the interconnectedness in the mind how our perceptions and our intentions, the questions we ask ourselves, the answers we give ourselves, how we go about forming those answers. How these processes are all interconnected. They can be interconnected in a way that leads to suffering or in a way that leads to happiness, to freedom. It all depends on how we use those interconnections. So whether interconnectedness is going to be a good thing or a bad thing is up to us. As we meditate we are given the tools to make those connections a good thing, so that the way our mind functions causes less and less suffering for ourselves and less suffering for the people around us. As you work through the processes that ordinarily would give rise to greed, anger, or delusion, you find that you can manage them in a way that doesn't have to stumble into those unskillful states. At the same time, you find that the people around you are subjected to less of your greed, anger and delusion as well. The whole atmosphere surrounding you changes. As you bring the mind to a more skillful state you find that it tunes into the skillful habits of the people around you. This forms a kind of connection as well. As you work on this, however, you find that the connectedness is not nearly as interesting as the potential for freedom. How is it that we do have this freedom here to make choices? Where does this freedom come from? Where does it lead if we pursue it? The Buddha's insight into interconnectedness was that it was a very complex process, and complex processes like this, by their very nature, have points where they cancel one another out. There was a mathematician who studied these points and discovered what he called resonances. Points where the different processes just cancel each other out, and suddenly you're outside the system entirely. The same goes with our experience. The Buddha found that you can manipulate causality to get beyond causality. This is where it really gets good, because when you can get outside of this interconnected system, you find that your happiness doesn't have to depend on interconnectedness. It doesn't have to depend on the good or bad decisions of other people. It doesn't have to depend on your own good or bad decisions. Totally free, totally independent. That's where it gets really good. When you have a happiness that's totally independent, then as you continue to live in the world you find that you can give more freely of wise decisions, right decisions, skillful decisions, because you don't need the feedback that comes from other people. The sad side to ordinary interconnectedness is that a lot of it consists of feeding. Different people feed on each other. Sometimes the feeding is mutually beneficial, sometimes it's not. Some people are willing to offer emotional food to other people, they're happy to do it, they're glad to do it. Other times the process is not so voluntary, but as long as we're living in this interconnected system, we're always subject to this process of feeding. One person depends on another. The second person depends on the first, or depends on somebody else. As with all food chains, it's always ready to break at some point. There's always that uncertainty, and no matter what's given in the food chain, there's always going to be hope for something in return. When you get outside of the chain though, you don't need anything from anyone, and you're happy to give whatever you've got. That kind of giving becomes truly pure giving. Some people think that the idea of a totally independent source of happiness is selfish, or a way of running away from the real world, but it's not. 
how can it be selfish when you're in a position that allows everything you do to be an act of giving? What exactly is it running away from? It's running away from your old feeding habits, your old dependencies, which are not only unstable for you, but can also be oppressive for others in ways that you might not think, but they're there. Just the fact that we have this body depends on food, clothing, shelter, and medicine and where do those things come from? How many people are happily involved in the process that brings us food, happily involved in the process that brings us clothing, shelter, and medicine? There may be some people who are happy to do it, but a lot of people are doing it through pain and suffering. That's why we chant that reflection every evening, to remind us of this fact. So that's what you're running away from. You're running away from a mode of existence that depends on the exploitation of others. That's not a bad thing to run away from. It's not a bad thing to abandon. Especially when running away in the proper way puts you in a position where you can still be giving. Then the way you continue to participate in this interconnected system until the day you die is purely through acts of giving, purely selfless, because you don't need anything from anyone else. That's where we're headed as we practice. So, keep that in mind. There is interconnectedness in the world, and it can be a good thing if you make it a good thing. But it has its limitations. It's always conditional. And it always involves taking. People like to think of interconnectedness as light reflected in multiple mirrors, or light beams going from one jewel to another in Indra's net. Each jewel illuminates and is reflected. In the other jewels. These are all pretty images, but that's not the way interconnectedness functions in the actual world. One animal feeds on another. One person feeds emotionally on somebody else. When the early Buddhist texts teach causality to young novices, they start with a simple fact. All life depends on feeding. So interconnectedness is not simply light beams going from one person to another. It's a process of feeding which is not always a pretty process. So although you can make it good at least relatively good and helpful the best way to use the process is to get so skillful, so clear on this element of freedom contained in each of your choices moment by moment that it opens up to something totally other where there's no need to feed when there's no need to feed you're totally free imagine going into the wilderness without the need to feed you could wander around forever it's because we need to feed that we carry food with us which puts a limitation on how long how far we can go or even worse some people go hunting that's really oppressive if you didn't have to. Feed you could wander everywhere forever. No limitations. No need to oppress anyone. We're limited by the fact that we have to feed. So, when we practice we make the mind stronger and stronger until ultimately it doesn't need to feed anymore. It's not like the body. The body always has to feed, but the mind when it reaches a certain level of strength, opens up to something totally other where there's no need to feed that's the good news of the Buddha's teachings. That the processes in this interconnected world in which we live can be mastered in such a way that you go beyond it totally, and then for the rest of your life, what you put back into the process is purely a gift. Being still. September 19, 2003. Notice just now when we finish chanting, the sound of the crickets was suddenly a lot louder. It's not that the cricket suddenly sang louder, but for us it seemed louder because we were quieter. This is an important principle in training the mind. The quieter you are, the more you see. We talk often about how there's a doing, there's a kama in every present moment. There are choices you make with every present moment, and sometimes the emphasis may seem too much on the doing. But remember that being quiet is also a form of doing, and sometimes it's the most skillful doing, the most skillful thing you can do. Try to keep the mind as quiet as possible, as still as possible, as if you're listening to music far, far away, and you want to try to make out the tones, make out the melody. You have to make yourself very quiet. And in the same way if you want to see things in the mind, see things in the breath, you have to make yourself very quiet. The quieter the mind is the more it sees. So, when the breath comes in, the breath goes out, the mind doesn't have to come in and out with the breath. 
you choose a spot in the body where you want to stay, and you stay right there. Ajahn Lee gives the image of a post at the edge of the sea. The tide comes in, the tide goes out, waves come in, waves go out, but the post doesn't come in and out with the tide or the waves. It stays right where it was, where it's been all along, and because it stays put you can tell exactly how high and low the tides are, how far the waves come in. The more still you are the more you have something to measure things against. It's like those measuring things they have next to the I don't know what they call them to tell what the flood level is. Those things have to stay in place. If they don't stay in place they're totally useless. Or you can make another comparison with equipment you use in a scientific experiment. If the equipment is placed on a table that wobbles, or if an earthquake happens and knocks everything to the floor, the measurements that come out of that equipment are worthless. You have to throw them away. So it is with the mind. When the mind is moving around like that you can't really see things for what they are. You simply go along with the flow, but how fast or how slow the flow is, you don't know. So, when we sit here and meditate try to find a spot that's comfortable and then just stay right there. You don't have to do a lot of things. Just do one thing consistently. And this way you have some way of measuring the breath, the ins and outs of the breath, you have a way of also measuring the movements of the mind. Once you have that reference point then even the most subtle movements become clear. But if you move around a lot you have no idea whether other things are still or moving around as well. So find a nice quiet spot to stay and then just stay there as comfortably and still as possible. And watch. Keep your mindfulness alert. Think of it as like throwing a pot on a potter's wheel. You put the clay on the wheel and the wheel turns around. And you've got to make your mind as still as possible. You have to make your gaze as still as possible as you move your hands up along the clay to shape the pot. If you glance around, if your mind moves around, the pot is destroyed. Your hands suddenly lose their balance and go off. In one direction or another. The difficulty of course is that the mind's not used to staying. It's used to running around. And if it wants to run around, there is that role for it in the meditation. You can move it through the body if you like. Remind yourself that the mind has lots of choices. There's no one right way to meditate all the time. You have to be sensitive to what's going on. Sometimes the emphasis has to be on the stillness. Other times it has to be on the reflection, the contemplation, on comparing things. But always remember that you have this range of choices. So many times we get stuck in a particular way a type of behavior because we forget the choices that are available to us. And then we miss things. It's like deer. In the winter. When the snow falls again and again and again, the deer tend to follow the same path through the woods, and halfway through the winter you find that if you go along that path, the bark on either side of that path has been stripped clear off the trees. And they say that if it's a long winter and the deer strip all the bark off the trees next to the path, and there's no more bark right there, they'll die, even though there's plenty of bark in the rest of the forest. But they stay in that particular path, they don't wander off. And with so many of us that's the way it is with our minds. We have certain types, ways of behavior, certain patterns of behavior, and we just stay right there. We forget the other alternatives available to us. So when you find that your mind is too busy in the meditation trying to figure things out remind yourself that you also have the alternative of being very still. If you find that being still gets too boring, remind yourself that you do have the other alternative of moving around, but you test it for a while and see if it's the right alternative. Maybe being still was the right thing to do and it's simply that you were getting impatient. In that case you turn on your impatience. Say. Who is this that I have to listen to? Of course when you track down the impatience, when you track down that voice that was complaining in your mind, you realize that there was nothing behind it. It's just a role that the mind takes on. But you don't necessarily have to believe it because there's not necessarily anybody there. The important thing is that you realize you have this range of choices as you meditate and as you get better at the meditation, you get a better sense of what is the appropriate time for being still, 
and what is the appropriate time for contemplating and questioning things and trying to figure them out. One easy test is that if you're trying to figure things out and, instead of getting clearer they get more and more complex, more blurry, that's the time to be still again. Just sit for a while and be very, very still to watch. And then after a while you get a sense of when the mind has had enough stillness. In the beginning stages of the practice, a good rule of thumb is that you want to be as still as much as you can, because it's the stillness that gives you the perspective. Don't be in too great a hurry to gain insight. Don't be in too great a hurry to figure things out, because the real sensitivity that's going to open up. New channels of possibilities in your mind has to come from these points of being very, very still. So even though part of your mind may start telling you, this is stupid. This is crazy. You're not learning anything. You're just sitting still, still, still. What are you going to learn from that? Remind yourself that you learn perspective, you learn sensitivity. You're putting yourself in a good position to see things. And just as a hunter can't control when the game is going to come past, you can't control when the opportunities for insight are going to come, but you can position yourself in the right place. Right here at the breath, very still, very calm, very watchful. Because when real insights come, there's both the stillness and the alertness, the contemplation. They come together in points like that. And because for most of us the stillness is the hardest thing to learn, that's what we've got to emphasize the most. Friends with the breath. October 1, 2003. When we come out to a place like this, sit down, close our eyes, we find that the physical luggage we've brought along with us is nothing compared to the baggage we're carrying around in our minds. And one of the first tasks in meditation is to let go of that baggage, for otherwise it keeps interfering, keeps getting in the way. We want to be with our breath, but thoughts of the past this person, that person, our work, our relationships, issues out in the world just keep coming and getting in the way. So we need some techniques for keeping them at bay. It's one of the reasons we have these chants at the beginning of the meditation. Think of them as thinking tools. We often think of meditation as a process of not thinking, but you have to think your way to not thinking in. Other words, learn to use your thinking processes in a skillful way before you can let them go. The various contemplations we have in the chants are there to help us with that process. For instance, the chant we just had on the world just now. The world is swept away, does not endure, it offers no shelter, there's no one in charge, one has to pass on, leaving everything behind, the world is insufficient, insatiable, a slave to craving. It all sounds pretty negative, but it has a positive use. You can keep reminding yourself every time issues of the world come up in your meditation just what the world is like. No matter how nice you want the world to be, the world just can't be perfect. That is a liberating thought. The events in your life that you felt that you didn't handle very well you look back and you realize that there's no way that everything can be totally perfect, no way that anything can come to total completion. The nature of the world is that everything is left at loose ends. Many times there's a temptation, when a thought comes up in the meditation, to follow it through, tie up the loose ends, bring it to a conclusion. But the nature of the world is that there are no conclusions. The work of the world never gets done. When people stop working, it's not because their jobs are finished, it's simply they start wearing out, they can't work anymore. They have to leave the work for someone else to do. Sometimes other people pick it up, sometimes they don't. This is unlike the work of the practice, for the practice is something that can reach conclusion, can come to completion. And so, although the situation in the world out there is pretty hopeless, the situation in this internal world is not hopeless which is why energy devoted to the practice is energy well spent. Think about that every time thoughts of the world come up and get in the way of your meditation. That's simply the way the world is it's all incomplete. And then we have the chant on the four sublime abidings. Those are also useful things to think about. If there are people you've wronged or people who have wronged you, you spread thoughts of goodwill. If the image of anybody comes up in your meditation, that should be your first reaction. Goodwill for that. 
person. And good will not in the sense that you want to get further entangled, but that you wish that person well. To truly wish well you have to wish, one, that that person can find true happiness inside and, two, that you can find true happiness inside too. The more true happiness you can find inside, the better your relationships are going to be with everybody. You don't need to feed on anybody else. You've got your own inner resources. Thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of compassion, thoughts of sympathetic joy or appreciation. Extend those to everybody. And then develop thoughts of equanimity, realizing that ultimately each of us has his or her own karma, his or her own actions, that we're each responsible for our happiness and for our suffering. What this means is that you've got to work on your own karma which is what we're doing as we're meditating. Working on skillful karma, the noble eightfold path, which is the path we're trying to follow right here. As the Buddha said, that's the ultimate in skill, the highest form of karma. It harms no one, and it's beneficial for ourselves, not only in terms of developing happiness within the world, but also in taking us beyond the world. This path comes down to three things. Virtue, concentration, discernment. At the moment we are focusing on the concentration. But all three are involved. Virtue is a quality of normalcy in our intentions, harmlessness in our intentions. As we are sitting here meditating, we're not harming anybody at all. Not only that, we're not planning to harm anybody. We're here focusing on getting our mind straightened out. And discernment comes into the equation as well, because you have to be discerning in how you focus your mind. So find a good object to focus on. Once you clear the decks through your reflections, look for your breath. It's always there. The question is whether your thoughts obscure it or not. The kind of thinking that comes from the reflections we have in the chants should help bring you to the breath with a sense of the importance of what you're doing. If true happiness can't be found in the world, then find it here. Working with the breath in and of itself, as the Buddha says, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world in other words, any thoughts that would get you entangled in any sense of world outside. Just put them aside. If they come up, try to let them go. Don't let them interfere right here. Because what you're working on is a happiness that doesn't depend on the world. Anything that depends on the world is bound to end up in disappointment because, after all, the world is always at loose ends. But as we work on the mind here, we're developing qualities that can come to completion, that don't have to depend on the world things that come from within, things you can be proud of, the good qualities of the mind. Think about the things you ordinarily have to do in order to gain happiness in the world. It's always a struggle, there's always competition out there. The resources are limited. If you get something, it means someone else is not going to get it. And sometimes you have to compete in ways that you don't feel particularly proud of. But as you're meditating, you're developing nothing but good qualities. Mindfulness, alertness, integrity, honesty, truthfulness concentration, discernment. These are all good qualities, they feel good. And even if you don't get all the way to the goal, the path is a good path to be on. And the body in meditation is a good body to be in. If you really have goodwill for yourself, you've got to start right here, giving the mind a good firm foundation. A very visceral way of showing goodwill for yourself is just this. Focusing in on the breath, allowing the breath to be comfortable. If you stop to reflect, you realize that many of the things you've done in life that you later regret are things you did because you felt a sense of weakness, a sense of hunger. You needed something out there and you were willing to do anything you could. Think of to get it. But when you work with the breath like this and there's a sense of comfort, a sense of fullness coming from within, that sense of hunger goes away, that sense of weakness goes away and you find yourself acting more and more from a position of strength. You find that you can trust yourself more, that people around you can trust you more as well. So right here is the basis for embodying those four sublime abidings. All these ways of thinking keep pointing you into the breath. In terms of the narratives you tell of your life, they help direct your narrative toward being a person who wants to meditate, who has a sense of the importance of meditation, who's willing to make an effort at the meditation. So they deliver you right here. 
Unlike ordinary ways of thinking, which simply entangle you, these ways of thinking disentangle the tangle. Sometimes they cut right through. If you worked at minutely disentangling every single tangle in your mind, there'd never be an end to it. So you use these ways of thinking as knives to cut right through everything, to come right here to the breath, because this is the best thing you could be doing right now. Getting the mind to settle down, getting a sense of being at home with the breath, being friends with the breath. Don't think of the meditation as a struggle. If you regard your breath as your enemy, you're really in bad shape, because wherever you go, there it is. Learn to be friends with it. Listen to it. Work with it. Play with it. Learn how. The breath and the mind can cooperate with each other. This requires paying careful attention. As with any friendship, it takes time. But that length of time can be shortened if you're really attentive, if you really watch. Try different ways of focusing on the breath, different places in the body where you can focus, different ways of adjusting the breath. Sometimes all you need to do is think and the breath will change. Think, comfortable breath. Think, full breath. You. Don't have to do anything else just maintain that thought and see what happens. To the process of breathing in the body. Or, if you want, you can play with your focus. Instead of focusing on just one spot, try to focus on two spots at once. I personally always find that riveting. One spot can be in the middle of the head, the other spot can be down in the body, and think of a line connecting the two, and you want to be aware of both of those spots, all at once, all the time. When you can maintain that double focus, you find that your mind doesn't have any other hands to latch on to things. It's as if one hand is holding on to one spot, the other hand is holding on to the other. Your hands are full. So there's a lot to play with, a lot to work with, here in the present moment. As you work and play together with the breath, you become friends, you become companions. So instead of taking your thoughts of past and future as your companions which we do most of the time now the breath becomes your companion. Someone to work with, someone to play with, all the time. You're never really alone. This way the body and the mind become friends, they come into alignment, they strengthen each other. It's as with any harmonious friendship. Your strength gets more than doubled it gets multiplied many times as you work through your issues, as you get more and more familiar with the territory. This way you can drop a lot of your baggage. Even though you're still holding on to something, you're holding on to something good, right here in the present moment. Ajahn Lee's images of someone carrying a pole over his shoulder with loads on both ends. You see this a lot in Thailand. It's how people carry things around. You have one basket hanging from the front end of the pole, and another hanging from the back end of the pole. And, as he says, when you have a pole over your shoulder like that, it's difficult to sit down, because the baskets get knocked all topsy-turvy. So what do you have to do? You have to take the pole off your shoulder. And then, even though you may be holding something in your hands. In other words, you've dropped the past, you've dropped the future, you're holding on to the present moment you can sit down, you can rest. Ultimately you're going to work on letting go of the present. But in the meantime, you hold on fast. Because our minds have a tendency to want to grab onto things, so give them something good to grab onto otherwise, they'll just start grabbing at anything that wanders within range. So you've got the breath right here. And as you work with the breath, you find that the skill you develop becomes more and more useful. You can deal with any kind of breathing which means that you can deal with any kind of situation. The breath can help in all kinds of ways. You become the kind of cook who can just walk into a kitchen, and no matter what's there in the pantry, no matter what's in the fridge, you can make something really good out of it, because you've gotten really familiar with food, really familiar with the techniques for dealing with food. The same with the breath. You find there are all kinds of ways of breathing that help you when you're tired, when you're tense, when you're all antsy, angry, fearful, or bored. The breathing can help you in all kinds of ways if you pay attention, if you give it the time. So really get to know it. You've got a whole hour right now. You've got whole days right here. So work on this friendship. 
and you'll find that of all the relationships that you can have in this world, this is the one that carries you all the way to the end and past the end. It's the one most worth developing. Everything else comes out of this. If you can't be on good terms with your own breath, it's hard to be on good terms with anybody. So you've got time now to develop this friendship. Make the most of it. Outside of the box. November 16, 2003. We start the meditation every evening with thoughts of goodwill. When you practice goodwill systematically, you're told to start first with thoughts of goodwill for yourself, then with thoughts of goodwill for people who are dear to your heart, and then you work out gradually in ever-widening circles. People you like, people you're neutral about, and then even people you don't like. It may sound Pollyanna-ish. With people I hate, people that have been unjust, it just sounds a little too syrupy to say, may they be happy. But think about the type of happiness you're wishing for them. True happiness, happiness that comes from within. If they had that kind of happiness, they wouldn't be cruel or unjust. So, it's not just a syrupy kind of thought. It's actually a radical way of thinking about how the problems of the world might be solved if everyone could look within. This is a way of learning to think outside of the box. You read day after day in the newspapers about this political party, that political party. They've treated us unfair so next time around we're going to be unfair to them. Well, nothing gets accomplished that way, and you can't expect them to like each other and patch up their differences. That's the way the world is when everyone stays in the box. Look at our own families. There are issues in our own families that may never get patched up. A lot of people have long lists of grievances they carry around, grievances that will never be resolved. As the Thai Ajans are always saying, the work of the world is never finished. The issues of the world are never resolved. One side seems to win, and then all of a sudden its winning gets too oppressive to other people, and so they've got to fight back one way or another. When you think about the way the world is, you realize that the affairs of the world are never going to get settled. So we can't wait for the world's issues to be settled, we can't even wait for the issues in our own lives to be settled before we start looking for peace, because peace is the way out peace within the mind, a happiness that comes from within. If you find yourself entangled with a lot of issues in daily life, remember that they're never going to get absolutely settled. There is never going to be a final resolution. People die, but then that's not the end of the issue, they come back again. Old, dead issues get reformulated and revived. So try to learn to think. In ways to help disentangle yourself from those issues so that the mind can settle down. Tell yourself that you're doing this for one of two reasons. Either from the realization that your outside issues are never going to get settled, or that to the extent that those issues can be alleviated, the right actions will have to come from a clear mind. A mind that's not operating under the cloud of delusion, the cloud of ignorance, or the simple inability to think straight, to think things through. So, either way, the solution to the problem is to settle the mind down. Think in this way if you're having trouble getting the mind to stay with the breath. Ajahn Mahabua once compared meditators to two types of trees. One type of tree is standing alone out in the middle of a field. If you want to cut it down, it's easy. You just go out, figure out which direction you want it to fall, and then you cut it. There's no big difficulty. That stands for the type of people whose minds don't have a lot of entanglements in the world. They can sit down, focus on the breath, and stay with the breath with no problem at all. The other type of tree is one in the middle of the forest whose branches are entangled with the branches of the trees around it. If you want to cut that one down, you've got to use a lot of strategy. Learn how to cut this branch, cut that branch, disentangle things before you can then bring the tree down in the direction you want. So if you find that you're that second kind of tree, you focus on the breath, and the mind is not willing to settle down. Look and see where your branches are entangled and what you can do to cut them. Learn to think in ways that make it easy to disentangle yourself. A friend once told me about a question he had posed to a number of his friends. The question was this. Suppose that you're dreaming, and in this dream you're in a boat with your mother and your child, and a lot of other people you really feel you love a lot. 
a pirate comes along and demands one person's life. What do you do? He said as he tells this problem to adults, they think about their mothers and they think about their children, they think about sacrificing themselves and also think, well, if I sacrifice myself the kid will suffer, and they can never solve the problem. But if you pose the question to kids they'll say, well, wake up. It's just a dream, right? So, when you think about your life, try to see which problems are like that. You get into a situation and you lose your perspective on it. You lose your perspective on the alternatives that are available to you. You're trying to solve the problems even though they're dream problems. If you woke up, they wouldn't be there anymore. So wake up. That leaves you with the real problems. These are the ones you actually have to work through. If you can't seem to get anywhere with them, look at what the real issue is. It's not so much that the problem is intractable, it's just that your tools for cutting through the problem have gotten dull. Your mindfulness, your alertness, your concentration, your discernment, have all gotten dull. That means you've got to sharpen them. So you put the problem aside for the time being and say, I'll get back to that when my tools are sharper. So either way, whether your entanglements are dream problems or real problems, you have ways of thinking yourself out of the entanglement so that you can get the mind to settle down. We often forget that our mental tools are just that tools and they have to be cared for. Sometimes the situation they show us is not the real situation because they're dull. They've been overused. You haven't taken proper care of them, so when you look at a problem you don't really see it for what it is. That's why you can't see through it. So you leave the problem as it is, even though it's unsettled and unfinished, and turn around to take care of your tools. This is a lesson every craftsman should know. You're working on some wood and your saw hasn't been sharpened properly. Even though there may be a deadline for your work and you've got to get it done, you have to stop and sharpen your saw, however much time it's going to take. Then when you get back you find that you can do the job a lot better. Even though it may seem like you're wasting your time, or you're running away from the problem, you're not. You're simply putting yourself in a better position to deal with the problem, to see the problem for what it is. Many times you come back to it and realize it was a dream problem, or one of those problems where you've put up parameters around the problem that make it impossible for you to solve it. Like the brain teasers they put in the newspapers. They set up the conditions, so you have to ask, where have they not set up conditions? That's what gives you room to maneuver. Oftentimes you realize your inability to solve those problems stems from carrying in a few extra conditions that have not been placed on it. So, the best way to see that is to step out of the problem for a while. Sharpen your tools and then come back in. These are just a handful of ways of thinking about the unsettled issues in life that keep the mind from growing still. You've got to learn to disentangle yourself, even just temporarily if you're going to get the mind into the proper place, get it in proper shape, with the realization that some problems simply can't be settled. If you're going to wait until everything gets settled and then go for awakening, you're never going to get there. When the Buddha left home, he left a lot of issues. When he came back he was able to straighten all those things out, not by working on those issues directly, but by having each member of his family focus on his or her own mind. Almost the entire family became arrogance. Whatever issues they had before became non-issues. But then there are people who go off and then can't train their families on their return. There's the story of Rathapala. He leaves home, much against his parents' wishes. He comes back, wants to teach them, but they're unwilling to accept the teaching. So he just drops the whole issue, realizing that there are some problems that will never be settled. As the Buddha said, winning out over yourself is better than winning out over thousands of other people, because when you win out over other people it's never resolved. If they don't get killed off they're going to plot their revenge, plot their return. If you do kill them off. They come back as your children and then you've got a real problem. Karmic debts with your own kids. Victory over other people, victory outside, victory in war even if it's not victory in war but just every day back and forth never resolves anything. 
even when issues get settled in court in the most fair and just way, well, there will always be some people who feel mistreated and they'll find some way to get back. This is the way of the world. Nothing gets settled really. The only way to reach any kind of closure is to disentangle yourself. And this is your way out. Through training the mind. There's a poem where the Buddha talks about looking at the world and seeing nothing but conflict, nothing but people struggling over things when there's never enough. Like fish in a pond that's drying up. After a while there's not enough water for the fish, and so they struggle and struggle and struggle and make things worse. He saw that that's the way the world is. It gave rise to a real sense of dismay, a real sense of confinement. Then he looked inside and he saw that the problem was not outside. It lies in this arrow that we have in our hearts, this arrow of craving. We always want the things we like to be better than they can be, more permanent, more lasting. As for the things that we don't like, we want them to be annihilated. That craving is the problem, it's what creates all of our issues in life, our participation in those issues. Once you deal with the craving, that takes you out of the issue entirely. You're no longer involved in that constant back and forth, that unending back and forth. You're no longer grappling with other people over impossibilities. It's important always to realize that we have the choice to get out. In fact, we actually chose to get involved to begin with. If you try to trace it back to the beginning point, you'll probably never find it, but you will find a choice constantly repeated in the mind again and again in the here and now. One of the interesting points in the Buddha's teachings is that he never talks about a first cause, unlike most other religions. And where would you find that first cause? If there was a first cause in time, it happened a long time ago, too long ago to trace back. He realized, though, that the pattern of reality is constantly repeated over and over again, and that there's an element of creation with every moment. So focus on that. Look at the habits in your mind, the choices you're making right here right now. You see that the pattern of your choices is the real problem and that it's right here for you to look at, analyze, and solve right here. This is one of the few things that can get solved, the issue of craving in the mind. That craving is based on ignorance, and ignorance can be ended. What is it ignorant of? It's ignorant of what really is stress and suffering, what's causing it, what the end of stress and suffering is, and what qualities you have to develop to get out, to put an end to suffering. So you focus on them. What are you doing right now that's putting a burden on the mind? You're making choices that are putting a burden on the mind totally unnecessarily. So get the mind quiet to see if you can watch that happening. Until you watch it happening, it sounds pretty abstract. But when you can actually see the movements of the mind, that's when you can see. When the mind does this, it hurts. When the mind does this, it's harmful, and I don't have to do that it doesn't have to act that way. It doesn't have to think in those ways. This is where you resolve the issue. When you end this ignorance, all the other causal factors that lead to clinging, craving, and suffering all fall down like a line of dominoes. So this is where the problem lies, and it's up to us to take responsibility for it right here, right now. If we don't, who's going to suffer? Well, we're going to suffer. And when we suffer, we find it easy to make other people suffer, too. The Buddha doesn't force anyone to practice. He simply says if you want to resolve the issues in your life, this is how they get resolved. This is what you have to do, and it's up to you to choose. Am I going to finally take the way out, or do I want to go back and settle a few old scores before I go? The choice is yours, and you're making that choice over and over and over again. If you see that the desire to settle scores is dominating your mind, you can always choose to change. That's one of the good things about the path. You're never committing yourself to suffering forever. You can always say, I'm out of here. This is not a question of irresponsibility. You're taking your contribution to the troubles of the world, and you're removing it. That's a choice that each person has to make for him or herself alone. We're the ones who choose to get involved, so we're the ones who have to choose to say, I'm out of contributing to that particular problem. I'm out of that unending back and forth. 
I want to focus on the real problems, the real causes of stress and suffering in life. It would be nice if we could do this for everyone else in our life, but we can't. Each one of us has to do this for him or herself alone. The best way to encourage other people to do it is for you to do it yourself. That way they can see that it's possible. As the Buddha once said, having the Buddha as our noble friend, as our admirable friend, is what makes it entirely possible to put an end to stress and suffering. We've got an example. Without that example, everybody stays in the parameters of the problems, the issues, as everybody else around us defines them. Within those parameters nothing ever gets resolved. The Buddha thought outside of the box, he acted outside of the box, and now he's an example for all of the rest of us to get out of the box, too. Quiet in every way. November 22, 2003. Try to be quiet in every way. The body is sitting here quietly. The breathing is quiet, and as for the chatter of the mind, don't get involved. There are two ways of dealing with it. One is to block it out, say, with a meditation word like butto. You can just think butto, 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 very fast. It's like jamming the circuits. Or try to immerse yourself in the breath as much as possible. The chatter may be in the background, but don't pay any attention to it, don't give it any importance. If you don't feed it, you'll find that it gets weaker and weaker. The mind really does get quieter. And only when the mind gets quiet can you begin to notice things. Once when I was in Rayong a group of people from Bangkok came up the hill to where I was staying in the old ordination hall. They plopped themselves down in the hall and exclaimed how peaceful, how quiet it was there in the monastery. Then they pulled out their boombox and turned it on all the better to hear the peace and quiet with. That's the way a lot of us are when we meditate. The body's still, the breath is still, but the mind is like a boombox, broadcasting all kinds of thoughts and concerns. For many of us, meditation is the only time of the day when we get to sit and be with our thoughts without any interruption. But that's not what it's for. We're here to watch, to observe. So, we have to do what we can to discourage the mind's involvement with all that chatter. The Buddha breaks the mind's chatter down into two different activities. One is directed thought, and the other is evaluation. You direct your thoughts to a topic, and then you start mulling it over, commenting on this, commenting on that, backing up and restating things. Sometimes it's as if there are several voices in your head taking on different roles, evaluating things from different perspectives. So what you have to do is to turn your directed thought to the breath and evaluate the breath. You use the mind's verbal abilities, its verbal tendencies, but you're trying to direct them to a better purpose, a quieter purpose. When you direct your mind to evaluating the breath, there's not that much to think about. Notice when it's coming in, when it's going out. Notice when you're forcing it too much when there's a squeeze at the end of the breath, or a catch in the breath when you're trying to pull it in. Notice how you relate to the breath energy, which parts of the in-breath you like and don't like, which parts of the out-breath you like and don't like. It's amazing that you can have all kinds of opinions even about this. At the very least, though, as you get more interested in the breath, other thoughts quiet down because you're not feeding them. If you pay attention to all the vagrant chatter in the mind, of course it's going to keep on going. Sometimes simply paying attention to the extent of telling it to stop actually encourages it, so you have to try another approach, which is to direct your verbal tendencies to the breath. Think up questions about the breath. In general, that's how you direct your thoughts to things. You get curious and ask questions. What's this? What's going on here? Is the breath as good as it could be? What is a good breath? Do your best to get interested in the breath. To evaluate it you just have to watch it. The more still the mind, the more you can see. Ajahn Lee breaks the breath energy in the body down to three levels. First there's the in and out breath, then there's the waves of breath energy that go through the body along the nerves and the blood vessels, as you breathe in and breathe out, and then there's a still breath, which you can locate in the resting spots for the breath that he mentions in method 2. The tip of the nose, the palate the base of the throat, the tip of the sternum, the point just above the navel. 
if you can get really quiet, you can sense that there's a stillness at these points that you can access. And there's a way of focusing in on that stillness so that it seems to spread throughout the whole body, radiating out from those points. Now, the only way you can notice these very subtle breath sensations is to make the mind as quiet as possible. Just watch, like a hunter. The hunter has to be very still so as not to scare the animals away, but at the same time very alert so that he notices when they come. Or we can make a comparison with the mind state we try to develop when we're listening to something faint and far away, and we want to hear it very clearly. We get everything inside as quiet as possible, so that we can pick up the subtle sounds coming our way. The only way you can really pick up on the subtleties of the breath is to get the mind and body as quiet as possible, with your thoughts directed to the breath. If you make things quiet without focusing on an object, the mind begins to drift, and it has a very strong tendency to go to sleep or to blur out, blank out, which doesn't accomplish anything at all. There has to be a focus the focus of a hunter. Anthropologists say that when they try to pick up the skills of primitive tribes, these are the hardest of all the skills of a hunter because being a hunter requires so much mind-body discipline. So we need to be disciplined, even though it takes effort, for we're here hunting the deathless. In the beginning we're hunting subtle breaths, and then we're hunting the still breath energy, and then we're hunting the state of the still mind, and then we're hunting the very subtle movements in the still mind. This requires successive levels of getting more and more still. So if you sense anything disturbing the stillness, just let it go. Don't get involved. Don't let it entangle you. Direct your thoughts to being as sensitive as possible to the breath. This process develops to the point where you're so immersed in the breath that you don't even have to direct your thought to the breath anymore. It's as if your awareness and the breath are one. Then you just maintain that focus, that sense of oneness. That allows the mind to get even more still. Even the subtle level of inner chatter that goes along with directing the breath and evaluating can be dropped as well. In fact, you find that a lot of the progress in concentration practice comes from noticing even more subtle levels of chatter and letting them go. Then you run across an even more subtle level. You keep peeling away finding all kinds of crazy things being said in the mind. But you let them go. Until it's just the chatter that keeps the mind on its topic, whether it's the stillness of the breath, or a sense of space or a sense of knowing. When you can stay on these topics, they're called perception attainments. At that point your thinking isn't called directed thought and evaluation. It's simply perception, the labels you put on things, which hardly qualify as verbal sankharas their mental sankharas. Verbal sankharas are sentences, these are simply words. But still they count as a kind of disturbance. Stay with that particular level as long as it keeps you focused, and learn to let it go when it becomes an obstacle to seeing things that are even more subtle. You can take this approach as a basic principle all the way through the practice, because it embodies a lot of different teachings, like the Four Noble Truths. Look for where there's stress, in this case the disturbance, see what you're doing to maintain it, let it go. This approach also embodies the teachings on emptiness. Notice what your mind is empty of, notice what's still there, disturbing it, and see if you can let go of the disturbance without destroying your state of concentration. As the Buddha said, there is no happiness aside from peace, there is no knowledge aside from what can be seen with a still mind everything else is guesswork. As today's session draws to a close, we extend an invitation for ongoing engagement. Just as Buddha advocated sharing his teachings for the greater good, we urge your involvement. Help propagate these profound teachings universally by subscribing, liking, and sharing. Your active contribution ensures these invaluable insights transcend boundaries. Embrace this opportunity to ignite positive change and nurture empathy. We eagerly anticipate your presence in future episodes, uniting to enlighten minds and cultivate compassion globally.